sort of surprised you? I was surprised at, I don't remember the exact stats, but the projection of how much of the population is going to be, you know, how much it's increasing the older population. Yes, that's true. Because we, we're just, we're healthier. We're keeping people, and we keep people with very chronic illnesses alive longer. Mm -hmm. So I can't tell you how many of my people my age have parents in their 90s. It's, it's just very common now. And I would have said years ago, probably not so much. It was really rare to, to have somebody live to be a 90 or 100. It was a thing you talked about. Mm -hmm. Not so much. The number of centurions are growing, 100, 100 plus. So it's hard to, hard to hide from them. They keep showing up. Anything else? Okay, let's look at considerations in geriatric dose. Polypharmacy, very, very common. We, just, we, we define it as five, at least five or more medicines. Because with every medicine you add after that, the complexity of the regimen just gets more and more difficult. So my approach usually is I use one drug as much as I can before I add another. But if you look back on the way a lot of the evidence is, they are like use multiple little doses because then of drugs, because then you avoid side effects and you get the kind of the uh, added power of each of those drugs and how they act differently. So that just adds to complexity. So it is quite a balance and you have to look at all the time. If I use this drug and I push the possibility that a side effect will occur instead of adding another drug, what you know, where's the benefit in the in the risk? So that that's just common. The other thing you have to account for is that people self-medicate. Because some don't trust Western medicine, some don't trust medicine in particular. Uh, and so, and they'll read, they will read a lot. This is a group that will, chal that will challenge you. I'd say your 60 and 70 year olds are going to read a lot and they're going to they're gonna ask you about stuff. Well, my, I heard on TV or I read this and some of them are going to trust that a whole lot more than they'll trust you. Uh, so self-medicating, so counting in that. So when you take a med history or you have somebody in your group that's taking a med history, they've got to look at over-the-counter products and herbal products, supplements. Some things that people can buy, they don't consider drugs. So the words, the terminology you use. It's like when I went to the VA and I'm like, how many meals do you eat? I don't eat. I don't, I don't eat. I only eat one meal a day. Well, okay, you weigh 250 pounds. How are you doing that? I learned it was verbiage. Uh, so if I said, how, are you not eating dinner? No, I never eat dinner. Well, it's because you call it supper. You know, it's all those things that people <laughs> eat. I, I swear to you. And people like, I calorie things that you drink must not have calories in it because you can drink them. Okay? So a lot of it will be verbiage. And so you have to kind of get in the lingo of how your patients use terminology to describe their own behavior. Home remedies. Depending on where you live, people may have very unusual home remedies. Things they go out and pull out of the ground, make into a poultice, and then apply to themselves. Or they ground up and make a tea and eat. Mystical, magical, not medicine is always appealing. And so you have to kind of ask people. You have to get used to where you're living uh, and what they may, what. Uh, folklore or cultural lore they rely on to treat themselves. The closer you live to the border, you have to worry about what drugs are they going across to Mexico to get. When I lived in San Antonio, that was a big thing. Uh, we always had to ask, have you been to Mexico recently? Okay, what'd you bring back? I saw more drug fevers in San Antonio than I've ever seen here, and I think a lot of it's because of the, the drugs they were bringing across the border. So they can go into a pharmacy in, in Mexico and get a lot of drugs that we have to have a prescription for here. So depending on what border or where you live, it might be another, uh, another source. So, poly, so polypharmacy does a number of things. One is the more drugs you put together, the more interactions you have. 
So we've talked a lot about drug interactions. If it doesn't come to your mind when you're looking at patients, I will have failed. So have, have a source, a drug, a drug uh, interaction source. I bet your Hippocrates has, has I don't use it uh, in particular, but I think they're, I meant to look it up, but I think their driving source is probably lexicon behind them, which has a good uh, drug interaction uh, program. Greater risk for adverse events due to de decrease in metabolism, renal elimination. You have to think kidneys and liver. Now the liver, people usually do a little bit better. Liver has great capacity, even some disease may not even slow down their, their metabolic rate. But the kidneys decline. It takes a while to ramp it up when they're babies, and it declines as you're adult and you get older. You have to think kidneys when you think about drugs. Non-adherence. Now, it's a conundrum because older people usually are more adherent than younger people. However, the more drugs you give them, the more they will be non-adherent. So their mental status, their, their ability to think through a, uh, a, a or lay down a process. Uh, and so that's always one thing you want to ask them. Uh, is how do you remember to take your meds? How do you take your meds? Morning meds, usually, like I, we've talked about in the past, are usually pretty good for most people. The rest of the day, if it falls apart, so do the medicine. So how do you remember? The people I've seen most vulnerable are older patients who are living by themselves, somewhat functional, probably have family around that may bring in food or check on them, and yet the family will pretty much allow them independence enough to take care of the meds. I tell you, that is the biggest red flag. My dad, to the end, fought his ability to set up his pillbox and take them. But in the end, we figured out, you're not taking them like you should, but very resistant to somebody taking that over. Prescribing cascades. Have you talked about this? Has this word come up? <coughs> What's a cascade? It's one thing sets off another, sets off another, sets off another, sets off another. So when a waterfall, it's beautiful. Okay, it's great. Hits the rock, gets momentum, hits the next rock, you get a raging river at the end, okay? Dominoes, you hit one domino, if it's set up right, it can be a thing of art, right? It can be a thing of disaster, right? You ever played the, the game mousetrap? Okay, so in the end, you trap the mouse. Okay. So this is a cascade of events to total disaster, is a prescribing cascade. It means that a new problem shows up that is probably related to another drug and another drug is prescribed. It's, it's treated as a new entity, so more things are prescribed. That sets off another problem, which is given another drug, which sets off another problem, which gives another drug, and eventually leads to somebody in the emergency room, somebody's died, somebody's fallen, somebody has gotten uh, irreparable damage. So I'm going to show you one. This is a published one, so this one happened. So this is a 71, so not that old, 71, how, is, how do we uh, categorize them? Probably a young old, okay, young elder. 71, 68, Caucasian woman, she has high blood pressure, type 2 diabetes, allergic rhinitis, hypothyroidism, depression, osteoarthritis, Meniere's disease. This is why she comes into the emergency room as her problem list, and those are all the meds she's on. So she's on amlodipine, she's on furosemide, spironolactone, potassium supplement. She's on metformin and atorvastatin for her lipids. Uh, she has allergic rhinitis, she's got um, nasal steroid and montelukast. She's on hypothyroid, so she's on thyroid replacement. She has depression, so she's on citalopram. She's also on Abilify and Welltrin. Okay, so she's on a second generation antipsychotic, which means she probably wasn't responding well to the citalopram. And then what's the bupropion? Why do we do that? Augment. Okay. 
And then she's got she's on us she's on ibuprofen for osteoarthritis. She's on omeprazole because of stomach upset or GERD and Meniere's disease. She's prescribed hydroxyzine. Okay. This is common. This is not an unusual person. Very very common. She comes in the emergency room after she fell. She fell in the bathroom. Uh, nine days before that admission, she had a stroke. <laughs> Her fall was attributed to gait and balance problems <coughs> due to multiple reasons. And she had multiple fractures, neck and, and the spine. Okay. So that's her admission information. So the cascade begins. Four months before she was admitted, uh, she was given amlodipine uh, by her PCP to control her blood pressure. So what kind of drug is amlodipine? It's a calcium channel blocker, non-hydropyridine. Uh, no, it, it's uh, it's a it's a dihydropyridine. So, what is one of the what are one of the, the side effects or some of the side effects of calcium channel blockers? <laughs> peripheral edema. It's a they're peripheral vasodilators, so they they tend to cause um, decreases in total peripheral resistance. You set off the renal angiotensin uh, cascade, and you end up with increased fluid volume. So and so she probably got some degree of, of that. Three weeks after that was prescribed, her she saw her cardiologist and they put her on two diuretics. Okay, so she had a history of heart failure, I think. Did she? No. no. Why they put her on two diuretics, I don't know. But this is this was a published case. So if you're roast my 20, is that dose reasonable? Yes, yes, reasonable dose, far on lactone, 25. I have no idea why they did that. Uh, I don't. So for edema and lower limbs, somebody else seeing her, a new problem set up, likely caused by the amlodipine, but treated as a new indication. So there's the first fall in the cascade. Three weeks after that, they put her on Tobias, which is a strong antimuscarinic or overactive bladder. Okay. So you're on these diuretics, you're peeing all the time, okay? But it was a urologist who saw her, okay? You all laugh, but I'm telling you, this is just normal, normal, okay? A month after that, her PCP, she just she complained of dry mouth, put her on biotin gentle uh, mouthwash. Okay, so that's not a big thing, but it was in response to a, a drug reaction, or an ADR. So a month later, she lost her balance, she's in the bathroom, and she fell and hit her head on the bathtub, head and neck, and that's where she ends up in the hospital, okay? See how each problem, ADR, most likely was treated as a new entity by each person. They were all different people. So PCP, cardiologist, urologist, I'm not faulting them because she's, but I'm telling you, fragmented care. And then the PCP, probably not having enough time. You're lauded 15 minutes. You got seven minutes to see them once everybody's checked them in, done everything they're supposed to. And you just cannot assess it that fast unless you have a high index of suspicion. Okay? Didn't catch it. Now here we are. And these are all things we would expect an older person to have, right? Okay, so you might get edema. You probably will have over, uh, you know, bladder problems, urine uh, leakage. Uh, can't hold your urine to get to the bathroom and dry it out. Okay. I'll tell you on average, uh, this was a common complaint I'd hear out of the patients I saw, dry mouth. And commonly I would look on their list and they would have three or four medicines that had anticholinergic effect. Because it's so per pervasive in most of the drugs that they are going to use. That is a, that is a common prescribing cascade. So, the amlodipine was a peripheral demo that kind of set it off. Um, she And there it shows you each of those. I think we talked about all of them. So the drugs that increase fall risk. We talked about this back in osteoporosis. You probably talked about it with Maria Jones. But you've got diuretics with volume depletion, hypotension. You've got amlodipine, hypotension. Uh, with the abilify dizziness, the um, um, Celexa, also hypotension. So multiple drugs.
So this is what they did. Uh, she was an inpatient. They actually had a clinical pharmacist look at it, and, and this is, these are the things they did. They took the amlodipine away, put her on the ACE inhibitor. The re edema resolved. The spironolactone, the furosemide were discontinued. The urinary incontinence went back to baseline. They took her off of the tobias and the biotin mouthwash was Okay, so what do you do? Well, you got you have to strike a balance that over and under prescribing. So under prescribing means what? You got a problem and no drug addresses it. This is common in in uh, in geriatrics. So some things that people will look at, like, well, do I put them on a stat? That would be a common. Looking at now, sometimes it's very reasonable. You're looking at how much benefit are they going to get for the time that they have left. Okay. So it may make no sense to put an 85-year-old on a stat. Depends on um, how what their life is, their uh, physiologic age is. Avoid or decrease polypharmacy by tailoring medication regimens to the needs of the individual. They, were, they had her captive, they could do those things fairly quickly. You may not, in an outpatient setting, be able to do it. Again, it comes down to prioritize what is most likely to hurt them or necessary at the time, and you have to have follow-up. So some of it can be done all, all at once. Important to consider how appropriate medications are given the patient's age, remaining life expectancy. You got to think of how long do I have to treat them to see benefit. Okay. If it's going to help, if the benefit's going to be beyond their expected life life uh, uh, length of life, then don't put them on. Here's the scope of the problem with uh, changes related to age. One third of prescriptions are taken by those over 65, but they only make up 13 percent of the population. Okay, so you would expect some of that. They're older, they're going to have more problems. Okay, so I can, I can buy that. One third of those 75 and older who live in a community take five or more. And 50% self-medicate with over-the-counter or dietary supplements. So have a high awareness for that. Of nursing home patients, 40% take nine or more. So nursing homes or long-term care facilities require a pharmacist to, to review those. But the review is like once a month. Physicians, I think, have to see them once a month. So there's lots of things that can happen in between times. 28% of adverse drug events are preventable. That's a big thing. That's that medication safety. You are going to hear it till you want to throw up. Uh, people are going to be on you all the time about that in systems, big systems of care. They will have people dedicated to that because it's a big thing. The other is that if you're in a part of a hospital system and your reimbursement is linked to Medicare, if you get people coming back in the hospital too soon, then your hospital loses money. So that's a, that's a big thing with uh, Medicare uh, at this point. Of the uh, adverse reactions that are preventable, 42% were serious, life-threatening, or fatal. 28% of hospital admissions in the elderly are, are attributed to an adverse reaction. It's a big deal. Drugs are a big deal. Sometimes we treat them pretty lightly, but they, they, are, they can be very serious consequences of using them. Okay, so factors for ADRs in the elderly. So one is the number of, of drugs they take. The other is the comorbidities they have, because we can just make something worse. We give them a drug to treat one, it makes another worse, just like you saw in this lady. Liver and renal function. I can tell you, it's when I, when I first got to, uh, don't take this. So when I first